Hello everybody, my name is Bain and I am an educator at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium located in San Pedro, California. I am here to talk a little bit about geology, specifically the fossils of California. So to begin this talk, I will go over the outline. I will start by talking about some of the basic fundamentals of geology, then get into an intro to fossils, talk about what makes a fossil a fossil, what is a fossil. I will then get into some California fossil localities and some of the fossils that you could find within those localities, and then close off with a few local institutions that you can check out if you are interested in learning more about these fossils. To the right, I have an illustration from Cabrillo Marine Aquarium of three local trilobite species that you could find within some of these localities that we will discuss later on in the talk. So we'll begin geology fundamentals by talking about the rock types. There are three main rock types and we will begin by talking about igneous rocks. So within igneous rocks, there are two main types. We have intrusive igneous rocks and extrusive igneous rocks. Intrusive igneous rocks form within the ground, within the surface of the earth. So these are formed by cooling magma chambers. Extrusive rocks are formed from cooling lava on the outside of earth. They're extrusive, external. So these are formed from lava that erupts from a volcano. The two pictures shown here are chemically the same type of rock, exact same chemical composition. It's just they formed in different environments. So this intrusive granite formed within a magma chamber. The magma chamber cooled off. It cools much slower within the earth. So these crystals are allowed to grow much larger than they would for an extrusive rock. For this extrusive rock, it is lava that was erupted from a volcano. So it's exposed to the atmosphere and it cools much, much quicker than the intrusive granite. So these crystals are not allowed to get as large as the intrusive counterpart. Sedimentary rock is up next. So these are rocks that are made from sediment that have been solidified and turned into rock, otherwise known as lithification. Sedimentary rock can be formed from many things. So Typically, it could be formed from other rocks. So it could be formed from broken down or weathered igneous rocks. It could be from other sedimentary rocks or even the next rock that we're going to talk about, metamorphic rocks. But it can also be made from broken down biofacts like shells and bones, or it can also be precipitated or formed while in a water column chemically like these layered carbonates have. And you'll notice that these are, are layered. So sedimentary rocks are layered, and these layers actually represent different compositions within the sediment. So if you're outside in nature and you notice some layered rocks, you can go up and actually take a look at these layers and notice that they're compositionally different, whether it be from the chemicals within it to the size of the sediment to the color of the sediment, telling you the types of minerals and stuff like that. So that will determine which type of sedimentary rock that layer is. The final rock type is metamorphic rocks. So these are rocks that have been transformed due to being exposed to extreme pressures and or extreme temperatures. So these would be at like fault boundaries or really deep in the earth. So these are rocks that were pre-existing that have been altered due to these stresses. So they could be igneous rocks, they could be sedimentary rocks, and they can even be other metamorphic rocks that experience even more pressures and temperatures that are extreme. And the photograph here is a gneiss, which is a metamorphic rock. These are banded rocks that are typically banded dark and light minerals alternating. And they are usually formed from granites or sedimentary rocks that have very similar compositions to granites that have been subjected to extreme pressures and temperatures. Now that we've talked about the three rock types, let's talk about a few pretty important geologic concepts, starting with catastrophism.
catastrophism, that concept was born in the early 19th century by George Cuvier. And it basically states that Earth was shaped by these very energetic, sudden, short-lived events. And these energetic events were used to explain biblical events, like the Great Flood, the one with Noah and the Ark, and other biblical events. The next concept is uniformitarianism, which was used to contrast catastrophism. The term was coined by Willem Huell in the early 19th century, but was later popularized by Charles Lyell, shown on the right, in his publication from 1830 called Principles of Geology. What this concept stated was that Earth was not created by these short, energetic, sudden events, but was actually shaped by uh, very long, slow, gradual events that had these energetic, sudden, sporadic events here and there. This publication also brought forth the idea that the present is the key to the past. So the cycles and processes that are happening currently can be used to explain what happened in Earth's past. Continental drift is another important concept that was presented by Alfred Wegener, shown on the right, in 1912, but ultimately published in his publication in 1915, which translates to the origins of continents and oceans. What this states is that the continents appear to fit together. He noticed that Africa and South America look like puzzle pieces, and he suggests that they were once a unified landmass, Pangaea, and were then separated and drifted apart. So Wegener's idea of continental drift needed a how in how these continents separated. That's where plate tectonics comes in. This idea was solidified in the 1950s and 1960s by many scientists, and it ultimately states that there are two plate types. There are oceanic plates and continental plates. And these plates are constantly moving due to movement within the subsurface, movement within the mantle. This movement within the mantle is actually dragging these plates to and from each other. So that creates separation from continents. It also causes plates to crash into each other. And it also creates uh, seafloor spreading. So where there's no ocean, it creates an ocean. So we'll look at this diagram. On the top left we have Pangaea. We have unified land. Everything is connected. We go fast forward about 50 million years to where Laurasia and Gondwana are. We see the northern landmass with North America and Eurasia is being separated from the southern landmass with Africa, Antarctica, South America um, by seafloor spreading which is creating an ocean between them. And from there, you go down to the bottom left, flash forward to now, and you get our modern day look of what the Earth looks like. And that is because these oceanic and continental plates have been moving, crashing into each other, drifting apart for the past 250 million years. They were doing this well before as well. There are many supercontinents in our past, but here we're just talking about Pangaea and modern day. So we have a little diagram on the bottom right, which is showing how plate tectonics creates these different plate boundaries. So when we have two plates crashing into each other, is two plates coming together, creating a convergent boundary. So here we have a plate subducting or going under another plate. We also have in the bottom left plates that are going away from each other. These are diverging, this is where you get seafloor spreading. And then in the bottom right, we have what looks like two plates sliding right next to each other. This is what we call transform boundary. And we have this in our own backyard with the San Andreas Fault. So now that we've talked about some of the geology fundamentals, let's get into fossils. So what is a fossil? Fossils are petrified remnants of past life. These remnants can come from animals, plants, microbes, and even be a trace from these organisms. So for an animal, it could be the entire animal. It can be their teeth. It could be a skull. It could be a vertebrae. It could be a hoof. 
It could be their exoskeletons. For plants, we can have leaves, we can have pollen, seeds, the whole plant. Microbes, we can have the individual microbes, we can have microbial mats, stuff like that. And as for traces, these are things left behind by the organisms. So it could be uh, eggshell fragments, it could be footprints, they could be these things called coprolites, which is fossilized feces. It could be burrows for burrowing animals, many things like that. On the right is pictured a brittle star that is alive on the top from Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. And on the bottom is a picture of a fossilized brittle star that is also at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium within the collections. So how do these organisms become fossils? Once the organism dies, they need to be buried very rapidly by sediment and then lithified or locked in stone. Once the dead organism is buried in sediment and it is going to be lithified, the actual organism itself needs its organic material that made up its body to be replaced by minerals that will ultimately be the stone that the fossil is. To the right, we have a very generalized fossilization process with a fish. So moving from top and from left to right, we have a live fish. That live fish ultimately dies and it falls to the bottom of the lake or water body. And as that starts to decay, it just gets buried and buried and buried. Um, you want it to be buried fast, faster than it can actually decay. If it gets consumed or decayed, then you are not going to get a fossil. And as that sits inside of the sediment, it ultimately becomes lithified. And over time, that organic matter that is trapped within the rock slowly gets replaced by minerals and you get a fossilized organism. So where do you find fossils? You can actually find fossils globally, as long as you have the correct rock type that had the correct environment for these organisms to be fossilized. And the correct rock type to get fossils is sedimentary rock. Of those three that we talked about earlier, sedimentary rock is the only type that you will find fossils in. And this is because you need the organism to be buried by sediment very rapidly. And you need that sediment to be lithified and sit for a very long time, thousands and millions of years. And with these sedimentary rocks, you want them to be more associated with water. So these Sedimentary rocks associated with water, uh, the water actually, it's easier to get more sediments in there to bury what is being preserved, as well as there is more likely the chance of the environment being less oxygenated at the bottom, so there are less things down there to consume the dead organism, allowing it to be fossilized a little more easier. And to the right, we have a general geologic map of California. So we have the yellow, which is alluvium. That's basically modern day sediment. We have sedimentary rocks in green. That's where you will find fossils more likely. Not all sedimentary rock has fossils, but you're more likely to find them in sedimentary rock. We have orange, which is volcanic rocks. This would be the igneous extrusive rocks, so these are the igneous stuff that came out of volcanoes, and then the blue is crystalline rocks, which would be more igneous intrusive rocks. And then we also have a line right there depicting the San Andreas Fault, which is a um, transform boundary, which we talked about a little earlier. And this is not all 100% exact. You're going to find other rock types within these colored areas. This is just a general map. Let's now look at a couple fossil examples. So first off, we'll show you some shark teeth. These are fossilized shark teeth from Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. Next would be this trilobite cephalon from the Mojave Desert. The upper part of the fossil is the actual fossilized exoskeleton of the trilobite head, and the bottom half is the imprint left behind by this fossil. There are, of course, dinosaur fossils, which everyone has probably seen if you've been to like the Natural History Museum. Here is an example of an Allosaurus skull. 
We can even have microfossils. So here is an exposure of diatomite on Santa Cruz Islands within the Channel Islands off of the coast of California. The whitish rock exposed among the grass is diatomite, which is millions and millions and millions of diatoms that have been fossilized and turned into a rock. Some of you may have heard this be called diatomaceous earth. So that's what it is. Diatomite is diatomaceous earth. And this photograph shows on the left, these are live diatoms under a microscope. And on the right shows these fossilized diatoms under a microscope. And the last example I'll show here is of the oldest known fossil, which is about 3.5 billion years old. It is from the Archean Eon. And it is of a cyanobacteria found in Australia. So the picture here shows a live cyanobacteria from the USGS. Now let's get into some California fossil localities. I'll talk about these localities and the types of fossils that you can find within these localities. So how we're going to do this, we have a California map on the right showing all of the counties. I'm going to highlight a few of these counties and highlight on this geologic time scale the periods in which you can find fossils from within those counties. This time scale will then be shrunk and moved onto the map so that I can list the different types of fossils within the counties and name the different localities within that county that you can actually find the fossil in, whether that be a specific mountain or a specific rock formation. First county up would be Inyo County. From the geologic time scale on the right, you can see that you can find fossils ranging in age from about 650 million years, which is the Precambrian, through the Triassic, which ended about 200 million years ago. So in Inyo County, you could find trilobites within the Carrera Formation. You can find camel fossils near Tacopa Lake. You can find fossilized algal structures within the Reed Dolomite Formation. There are fossilized corals within the Lone Pine Formation. And you can find ammonites within the Union Wash Formation. Here we have a photograph of a fossilized Triassic aged ammonite from the Union Wash Formation. The next county is Kern County. And here you can see the fossils you can find are a little younger than the previous county. We can find stuff from ranging from Cretaceous in age, which was about 150 million years ago, through the Quaternary, a little bit younger than 2.6 million years ago. And within this county, you can find mollusks and echinoderms fossilized within the San Joaquin Formation. Fossilized shark teeth can also be found in this county in the Round Mountain Siltstone Formation that can be located at Shark Tooth Hill. Various mammal fossils can also be found at Red Rock Canyon in the Dove Spring Formation. You can find camel, horse, saber-toothed cat, rodents, and many other mammal fossils here. Here is a photograph from the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles of a horse jaw from the Dove Springs Formation. The next county I'll talk about is Los Angeles County. The age here is about the same as you can find within Kern County, so Cretaceous to Quaternary. And here you can find fossilized ammonites within the Santa Monica Mountains. Within the Modelo Formation, you can find a variety of fossils, including fish, bird, plant, and mollusk. And you can find more mollusk, fish, and marine mammal fossils within the Monterey Formation along the coast. I have a few photos to share with you. The first one is of a fossilized fish in diatomite. So you can kind of see the spine on the top part of the rock. You can see it on the bottom as well. It's a little hard to see, but that is a fossilized fish with most of the vertebrae and the ribs. This came out of the cliffs from behind Cabrillo Marine Aquarium and is in the collections at the aquarium. The next fossil is a picture of an exhibit at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. This is actually fossilized whale baleen that came from the cliffs around the aquarium. An interesting fact about fossilized whale baleen, it is extremely rare and there are only a handful of samples known around the world, and we have a couple at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium that you can come and check out.
The last LA fossil example that I'll share with you is of this marine mammal vertebra that is on display at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. This also fell out of the cliffs that are around the aquarium and is on display for you to check out. Now we'll move on to Orange County. So you can see fossils found in Orange County are a little bit older than LA. You could find stuff from about 200 million years ago with the beginning of the Jurassic through to the Quaternary. And here you can find some ammonite fossils within the Bedford Canyon. Fossilized plants are also able to be found within the Silverado Formation. Marine mammal and shark fossils can be found in the Topanga Formation. And you can find shark teeth, echinoderm, mollusk, brachiopod, and foram fossils within the Capistrano Formation. Here is a photograph of some fossilized megalodon teeth from the Capistrano Formation. Now we'll move on to the San Bernardino County, which you can see here we have a vast range of ages of fossils that you can find. We can go all the way from 650 million years ago in the Precambrian, all the way through to 2.6 million years ago in the Quaternary, a vast range of ages. Um, here you can find algae and bacteria fossils within the Beck Springs Dolomite. You can find mammal and bird fossils within the Barstow Formation. There are dinosaur tracks within the Aztec Formation at Mountain Pass. Plesiosaur bones have been found at Cajon Pass. And trilobite fossils can be found in the Marble Mountains within the Cadiz, Carrera, Chambliss, and Latham Shale formations. Here is another photograph of a trilobite cephalon. This one's from the Latham Shale within the Marble Mountains. And some more trilobites from the Latham Shale, but these are agnostic trilobites. They are very, very tiny trilobites, and that is the entire organism. There are two. There's an imprint, the one on the bottom is an imprint, and the smaller one on the top is the actual exoskeleton of the trilobite. Now let's move to San Diego County. Here we can find a similar age range to that of LA County, where it's Cretaceous to Quaternary. Here you can find shark teeth within the San Onofre Breccia. You can find crustaceans, sand dollar, mollusk, fish, and marine mammal fossils within the Santiago Formation. And near Vista City, you can find mollusks, corals, and bryozoans fossilized as well. Here are some examples of some fossilized mollusks that you could find near the city of Vista in San Diego County. And the last county we'll touch on is Santa Barbara County. Here you can find the most recent aged fossils, so late Cretaceous, so like 75 million years ago, through the Quaternary, which about 2.6 million years ago. And here you can find bivalve and gastropod fossils within the Gaviota Formation. And some of the coolest fossils you can find in California, pygmy mammoths on the Channel Islands. Here is a photograph of a pygmy mammoth being excavated from Santa Rosa Island back in 1994. Do you want to learn more about fossils? So you can check out these establishments that are in Southern California to learn more. You can check them out either online or in person once things open up a bit more. You can come to Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. Here you'll be able to see a lot of the fossils that were shown within this presentation. We have quite a few of those on display as well as within our collections. You can go to the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. Here you can see a bunch of dinosaur fossils. You can also go to the La Brea Tar Pits and Museum in Los Angeles. Here you can see ice-aged mammals. Um, you can also go to the Western Science Center in Hemet. Here you can see more ice-aged mammals and they have a Tyrannosaurus skull. Or you can visit the ALF Raymond M Museum of Paleontology in Claremont. Here they have more dinosaur fossils. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this talk about fossils.